something. So. Maybe I'll use it somehow. Good afternoon, me. everyone. Thank you all for coming to this afternoon's plenary session. My name is Carol Ishimaru. I have the honor and privilege of being the president of APS. And as APS president, I get to organize the plenary for the annual meeting. In um, developing the session, I was struck by a theme of communicating science. And I quickly realized that Pro Professor Larry Madden had used the same theme back in 1995 uh, for his plenary session. And the, the old emphasis that Professor Madden placed on the plenary was why it was important to have effective communication. And also, what were some of the issues that APS needed to be aware of for the 21st century. And since 1995, during that plenary, even some of the biggest skeptics of our, these grand challenges, such as global climate change, diminished water resources, and the burgeoning increase in population growth, have become, uh, have, have started to herald a call to arms, if it were, to meet these incredible challenges. Plant pathology plays a key role in, these, uh, in all of these areas. In our discipline, I believe is essential to meeting what I call the needs for the five plant pillars of any prosperous society. And what I call these pillars um, include one, food. We need food. As Norman Borlaug indicated, you can't have peace on empty stomachs. Right? And two, we need feed. We have to feed the animals that also feed us. We need fiber to clothe and to house us. And we need the forest for our environment and our natural resources. But I don't want to forget flowers. Let's not forget flowers. Imagine a world without flowers. Plant pathologists are very important to flower production and all the other recreational aspects of plant production. There's a great need for research, education, and outreach to address these five uh, pillars. And one of the, even just looking at the issue of food production, some estimate that we need to increase food production by 70 to 100 percent in the next 38 years. More food has to be produced in the next 38 years than has ever been produced by humankind. Huge challenge. Now, each of you is going to have an opportunity to influence government, citizens, and uh, the public about areas that are going to affect our ability to meet these great challenges. And my question is, will you be ready? I hope that we can, through today's plenary, prepare you with some skills to help you with this. Um, it, you know, you might be just in a dinner conversation with one of your relatives. Who knows how they're going to vote on an issue? You might have a say in how they, that affects them. I'd like to have an influence on my father sometimes. Um, but it might be a larger public venue. Many of you, you know, we're professionals. Many of you have big audiences that you're put in front of and have a, a huge influence on. But it doesn't matter. The question really is, are you prepared? Do you feel confident that you can communicate the, the messages we want you to communicate. So uh, Dr. Manic, Madden's articles really describe the why this is important. And throughout uh, this meeting, the Public Policy Board has put together several sessions to help you become more familiar and articulate in specific areas. But today, I want to focus on the how. It's not enough to just know the area, the issues, it's important to be able to have the skills to communicate effectively. So it was my goal to provide APS members 
the opportunity for learning some of these communication skills. And my simple rationale is that the, um, the better able our community is at communicating these important uh, value of plant science and our discipline, the greater chance we have of increasing the public's attention and perhaps funding to help us to meet those five, those great challenges. So I, thinking about this, I was convinced this was important, but I quickly realized that I don't know very much about communicating science, not really. And so I really sought out some experts on this subject. And I was delighted to learn about the Center for Communicating Science at Stony Brook University, their junior school of journalism. I contacted them just through an email, and I was so pleased when Valerie uh, Lance Gefford contacted me and was, shared my enthusiasm for the idea of creating workshops and a plenary around this session for our APS members. Um, it is with great pleasure that I welcome Valerie Lance Geffrow, and uh, who will facilitate this session along with Yvonne Kaplan List. This is the first ever interactive plenary at an APS meeting. It's quite a leap of faith. I really appreciate all of you coming, and I hope that you'll enjoy it as well as come away with some skills that you find truly valuable to your future. Thank you. Hi, everybody. How are you? Good. Thank you, Carol. I mean, in hearing what you just spoke about, I'm, I'm so humbled to be here. I'm an actor, so this is, you know, I'm kind of in a very different river right now. Um, I was uh, teaching in the theater department at Stony Brook for 10 years, and what sort of this opportunity fell into my lap. Alan Alda started the Center for Communicating Science. Um, he, I don't know if you remember this, but he did a show called Scientific American Frontiers, and he was the host of that show for eight years. And during that time, he went around and, and talked to literally hundreds of scientists about what they did and why it mattered. The typical format for an interview show is that both the interviewer and the interviewee know what the questions and the answers are going to be before going in so that everybody appears smart. And Alan didn't want to do it that way. He wanted to go in from a place of complete innocence and really have to learn something from the scientist. And what he discovered out of that process was that when the scientist was put in a situation of, of having to explain themselves one-on-one, -on -one, that a whole new level of communication emerged. They couldn't go into lecture mode. They had to really talk to the person who didn't necessarily understand what they were talking about. And so he thought, wouldn't this be wonderful if we could train scientists right out of the gate to learn to communicate effectively to the public one-on-one -on, -one on a very human level? So he started going around to universities and sort of posing this as an idea. And it fell on many, many deaf ears until he came to Stony Brook. And he was actually there promoting a book. And he said to this, uh, the president at the time, you know, this is a big problem in the science community. Why don't you do something about it? And the president said, well, why don't you do something about it? And so uh, he did. He hooked up with uh, my boss, Howie Schneider, who's the dean of the School of Journalism. And we started the Center for Communicating Science. I teach improvisation to scientists, which sounds like the beginning of a joke. There's actually no punchline. That's, that's true. Um, I led a session uh, yesterday afternoon with uh, 12 people here. And at the end of, of the, the plenary, we'll do a couple of demonstrations of some improv exercises. Improv t with scientists, this is not about trying to get scientists to be funny or entertaining. That's sort of a tradition of the comedy circuit of improv. But what we do is to try to get scientists to connect and to tell their, to, to tell their work from the position of a storyteller and, and um, what, their, what their passion is behind the science. So we'll do a, a little demonstration of, um, 
of some of the exercises that we worked on yesterday. But I'd like to begin with, um, with a little documentary video that I put together um, that can give you a little window. I probably talked to 50 people uh, between colleagues and friends and, and neighbors, and a few of them are represented in this little documentary. So let's watch that, and then I'll see you in a second. Can you hit that video, Chris? What do you think the American Phytopathological Society does? American Phytopathological? Pathological? I don't have a clue. I, 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 I'm embarrassed not to have a clue, but I, I don't have a clue. Phyto. Hmm, I don't know. Pathological is the study of uh, what? Something wrong. Something, yeah, yeah. yeah. Phyto, I have no idea. Phyto. My best guess would be probably something with the different systems in the body. Um, pathological, I know the definition of that, but phyto, I don't know, you know. Assuming it has something to do with the mind. Um, is it something to do with the brain? <laughs> I would have no idea, actually. P-H-Y-T-O. Okay. What not, you... not about dogs. Not that phyto. <laughs> not that phyto. Okay. <laughs> something, I don't even know, that switch, I don't know. Do you think the government should give money to the American Phytopathological Society? I don't think the government should. Uh, yeah, what's the organization about? I would have to know what it is first before yeah. I can say yes. Not necessarily. I mean, eugenics is also something that sounds like something, but doesn't necessarily prove a good cause. Oh. I guess it's a good thing I'm not the American government, because I don't know. I mean, I think to give money to anybody, the government should know who they're giving it to and what the purpose is to begin with. I mean, they give money for everything else, so why wouldn't they, you know what I mean? If I told you that they um, deal with plant disease and making sure that we can feed the planet okay. and keeping our forests alive, what, do you, what is your opinion of the organization based on that? Well, I think that's a, a wonderful thing. Okay. Well, now I would say yes. Yes to government to support, support? Definitely, 100%. Yeah. Cool. Okay, then yes, I think they should give money for it. Yeah, we definitely right. need that. So if it's an organization that, that is based in trying to help that cause, then I think it would make sense to fund it, yeah. Do you think it's important that the title of an organization is clear to the public? Yes, uh, I would think so. I think they should change their name if they want to attract <laughs> money. Because if you ask someone, you know, if you're in favor of something or not, and they have no idea what it is or what they stand for, then they're not giving a very educated decision, I guess. Maybe if they change the name, it would, it would help them more. I would imagine it would make it easier to fundraise. Because this way, we don't feel as silly as we do right now by not knowing what it is. <laughs> like right now, it's like a guess yeah. for us. <laughs> now that you say it, I connect the words. I could connect the words phyto to pathological. Maybe a little description for what, you know, what it's about. P.S. Yeah. This is what we do. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I want to fight it to be a dog here. <laughs> so the objective of that was not to get you to change the name of the organization, but to simply illustrate a point that when speaking to the public, and using large technical terms, it's like you have a secret handshake, and the public isn't a part of the club. It's very distancing. And so figuring out a way that we can stay true to what the science is. Nobody in the Center for Communicating Science is advocating dumbing down the science. But instead of that, figuring out a way of communicating that message so that it's clear and vivid and lands with the public in a way that they can understand it. Because you can see the shift. Everybody is completely at sea when they're hearing the term, but then when they hear what it is, there's huge support behind it. So, you know, of, I've been doing this, you know, talking in conferences for about a year now, and I have to say of the, 
the numbers of people that I've talked to, your organization more tangibly affects every human being than any other organization that I've spoken with. And I, you know, I'm humbled by your work. And I hope that through the course of this workshop that, that we can be of some service and some help to you. Um, I want to introduce my colleague, Yvonne Kaplan-Liss. She's going to lead us through some uh, more of the interactive uh, mechanisms of the day. This is Dr. Yvonne Kaplan-Liss. Thanks, Val. Hi. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. We're actually going to team this, team this up. Val's going to be my Vanna White, and she's going to go in the audience. It's this like is... we called each other to decide what to wear, isn't it? Nah, that would have been planning. <laughs> this is a very interactive session, and it's a challenge because this is one of our biggest sessions that we've had, but that's why Val is here with her mic to, uh, to go into the audience. Ask questions as we go along. We're not going to wait till the end. If you have any comments, feel free. Uh, just raise your hand and Val will run over. Um, I'm going to call on volunteers if we don't get any. Um, and I'll introduce myself. Uh, Yvonne kaplan -Liss. I'm a physician and a journalist. I've been working at the Center for with the Center for Communicating Science since it started in 2009. Uh, I started out as a journalist uh, working uh, in television for Ted Koppel. Hopefully everybody knows who he is. Uh, on Nightline, I wrote his research and his questions, and I went and did some medical producing on his show, uh, but always wanted to be a physician and went back uh, to medical school. I'll tell you some stories and how I got involved with this as we go along. But today, what we're here to talk about is how to distill your message, how to speak clearly and effectively to your colleagues, but more important, to the public uh, and to the legislators and the government who make policy decisions that affect all of our work. So we're going to start with something fun. Raise your hand or yell out. Val, you're going to start in the audience because we're going to get some volunteers. Okay. Um, who is this? Okay, so by a show of hands, can somebody tell me, I mean, can you tell me if you know, understand baseball? Show of hands if you would say you're a pretty good understanding of baseball. All right. How many people really don't understand baseball at all? <laughs> I still don't. I do this talk a lot, and I still don't get it. So Natalie Angier is a New York Times science writer, and she says explaining science to the public is like explaining a baseball game to someone who knows nothing about baseball. How would you explain this paragraph to someone who thinks a pitcher holds water and a base is something in chemistry? So those that understand baseball, take a minute and think or write down how you would explain this to somebody that does not understand baseball. So I'm going to give you like a minute, and then I'm, Val's going to find somebody to read out their explanation. This, this and I don't see you, Val. Oh, you yeah. Hello? Hello? OK, I'll use this. Um, this lady actually held her hand up and said she understood baseball. So maybe you could just read, maybe you could just read the slide for us so we'll all hear the slide with dramatic expression. What's your name? Chris. Chris Huber. Come on, stand up, Chris. Little hand of applause for Chris here. Thank you. You have to remember, I'm a St. Louis Cardinals fan. OK, well. And, and so therefore, I'm not as familiar with the, the Yankees. As All right. <laughs> okay. We'll try not to hold that against OK. You. In the bottom of the ninth, Jeter worked a one-out one walk and stole second. But Papelbon got Swisher and Tiextra to strike out, swinging to the end of the game. All right, it's so to share off. a volunteer who could try to explain this to, the, I would say, about half of the audience that says they don't understand baseball. Who can explain it? OK, here we go. All right, so here's the deal. The Yankees are trying to win the game. Jeter gets on base. And that means he's got a chance to score, win the game for the Yankees. But the pitcher for the other team embarrassed his teammates because they struck out. They left Jeter on base, and the Yankees lost. Go Twins.
Okay, who didn't understand baseball? Can you raise your hand and tell me if up here, Val, or okay. over there? How about you? Did that okay. help at all? Is it on? It's on. Yeah. Okay. Um, it helped a little bit, the first part, but I knew something about uh, these different bases. But th uh, the second part was absolutely not clear to me, uh, even after the explanation. <laughs> what part, hold on one sec, Val, what part did it help you with? Understanding the game or understanding what happened? Um, it was not clear to me. Uh, first of all, I didn't know who Pablo Bon was. Now I understand he's, he's the pitcher. Um, and I didn't know what to strike out swinging to end, of, to, to end the game was. Um, and that, that whole second sentence after the explanation was still not clear to me. Okay. Uh, the first uh, sentence uh, became clearer. Can we give one other person a try? Who wants to try that understands baseball? Okay, here we go. I love that the women are really like the ones. Let's go, girls. Okay, so there's nine innings in a baseball game, and you get three three outs, and then the other team gets to hit. So. The bottom of the ninth means it's the very last of the last inning. And Jeter is the batter. And he, uh, there's one out. And he walks. That means the uh, pitcher didn't do a very good job throwing strikes. And uh, so Jeter gets to go to base. And then he steals second. So he gets to walk to first base, and then he steals second base. But Papelbon, the pitcher, is able to strike out the next two batters. And so since we started with one out, and he strikes out the next two batters, that means three outs and the game is over. And uh, I guess Papelbon's team wins the game. And I don't know enough about baseball to know who Papelbon plays. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, Val, can we go back to our yeah. person who admits she knows nothing about baseball? Really glad I work and what's today. her first name? Arena, okay. So what do you think now? It's clear. Um, <laughs> but I had to listen very carefully in order to follow it. But, um, but it is, it, I think it's clear now. But I, I'm not sure I could repeat it. <laughs> okay. Well, this is what we came up with. You want to read this out loud and tell us what you think? Who wants to read it? Someone who doesn't understand baseball. Joan. Joan Allen. Here we go. My husband will kill me if he thinks I don't know anything about oh. baseball. <laughs> okay, the game was almost over when the captain of the home team made a last ditch effort to win. He took a risk and it looked like it might pay off. His teammates tried to help him score, but they just could not make any headway because they were playing against the Red Sox. <laughs> A key player on the other team shut them down. The game ended and the home team lost to its most hated rival, the Red Sox. Okay, thank you. Let's go back to our victim. Okay. What do you think? Well, now I got a very different impression again. Um, so, uh, but honestly, I think, uh, who was it who, who I mentioned? Was it, okay. Anyhow, that was clearer to me than this story. Uh -huh. The story in, is, is very vague also. In, in understanding baseball or understanding what happened? In understanding baseball. Okay. Well, here's where we're... This is actually... I gave it away. What's the difference here? We're stressing the meaning and not the details. Right? So we're understanding what happened and why it matters. We are engaging the audience. We haven't given the details yet. But you have to engage the audience. Now you, you know, hopefully have more interest in understanding what baseball is. That first explanation I brought up, you probably went over your head and you didn't care, right? But the goal is to engage our audience at a level that we can effectively communicate and they can understand. And we can give the details later. And I'm, we're gonna, I'm gonna say that over and over again as we go along. But this is just in a fun example 
of what we need to do in science to reach and engage communities and legislators so they'll listen, they'll sit up and listen, and then we can go, go further. So why does translating our work even matter? Uh, I'll tell you why it matters to me, and I'm extremely passionate about it. Uh, I said I was a journalist. I trained at Northwestern. I spent four years getting a journalism degree, learning how to clearly and effectively communicate with the public through my writing, through my speaking, at a level that most newspapers reach, like fifth, sixth grade level. Uh, I left the uh, world of journalism and entered the field of medicine. Was so excited in my first two years of medicine. I was learning a brand new language, a language so I could read journals in medicine so I can communicate with colleagues and doctors that I've always looked up to. And that's what you do the first two years of medical school. You learn a brand new language. But I quickly came clear to me that I was losing all the skills that I learned through journalism and that I utilized in journalism when I was working as a journalist. I was even losing the ability to communicate with my mother and tell her what's wrong with her. And I realized this, this just can't be. When I hit the floors, uh, third and fourth year, you do clinical rotations. Uh, what struck me was, first of all, technologically backward compared to the you know, journalism. I was still writing orders that people couldn't read and mistakes were happening. Doctors weren't communicating well with the nurses and mistakes were happening. Doctors and, and nurses weren't communicating well with the patients. They were getting frustrated. They were coming back to the emergency room because they didn't follow doctor's orders but not because they didn't follow doctor's orders. We didn't communicate it effectively uh, and to the patients, so they knew what orders to follow. So I am extremely passionate about this, and I also saw it in private practice. When a patient came into my office and walked out, I'm a pediatrician and a preventive medicine specialty. When I was in private practice and a patient walked out of my office unvaccinated, that was my problem. I was not able to communicate effectively to the parent the importance of this vaccination. So that's why it matters to me and why I'm very passionate about it. But why should it matter to you? Well, the video shows why it should matter to you from the get-go. People need to understand the importance of the work that you guys do every day that you're passionate about. And it starts with what do you even do? How do you communicate that to the public so they know that it's important and why it should get funded and why they should care. It's very important for research collaborators and funding. I learned this morning, and it just reinforced what I learned when I was investigating your organization, that this is a very interdisciplinary field that you're in. You come from many different disciplines that speak many different languages uh, with different words and jargon. Even in our workshop this morning, if somebody was here, uh, a word I never heard of called, I th what was it, extension? <laughs> what, what was the word? Extension, which to me in public health is the same thing as outreach. Well, I had no idea what extension meant. And if I didn't ask, I wouldn't have known. And that's just one example that pops up constantly. And I'm a scientist. Well, it depends who you ask. A lot of people don't think physicians are scientists. but And I couldn't understand uh, what they were saying. So there is an example, plus in research funding, Interdisciplinary work is hot, hot, hot. They want to see different disciplines working together in order to get funding, and you have to prove that. And how do you prove it? By working closely and having successful relationships. And how do you do that? Through understanding and communicating with each other. There are grants like the National Science Foundation that have a requirement now that you need to put in your grants on how to uh, show that you're going to uh, communicate your work to the public. And what better way of doing it than proving you can communicate to the public in, in, in the work that you do. Uh, also, in these abstracts and grants, when you apply for them, they ask you to write a lay abstract. One of the reasons for this lay abstract is it's used by the federal agency, let's say, to lobby their legislator or, the, or Congress to say, why does our work matter that we fund? And so they can get a bigger piece of the pie. But these lay abstracts are important because they need to connect with this legislator, whoever you're trying to win over. They need to connect with them and make it clear to them why is it important for them and why should your organization get this money and be funded. So there's, there are reasons for it for research. Private donor 
uh, organizations is another example. Most of these donor organizations are uh, run by people that don't have a science background. They fund many different types of work. And again, they need to understand why it matters. Why should we fund your work? And if you clearly and effectively communicate it, you're more likely to get funded. Also very important for your students, if you're an academic institution, you're trying to woo some students that you want to come to your program, you need to connect with them to begin with. They need, don't know your language yet, that's what they're coming in to learn. And effectively communicating is very important. It's also important at your institution. At Stony Brook, before we're our current president who is a physician, we had um, President Kenny who uh, started the Center for Communicating Science. And she, I believe, was a European lit um, and had a career as a journalist for about five minutes and started the School of Journalism. That was a passion of hers. But she also runs the hospital and the Health Science Center. And she had no idea why what mattered to her unless we effectively communicated it to her. Why should we get allocated certain resources for the work that I'm doing or we're doing? And it's also very important for interacting with the news media. We give a workshop on how to interact, so I'm not going to go into it. But what you do is relevant and important. And if you can make it clear and newsworthy and speak to the media about it, your work will get out there. And there's ways of doing that, which we're not going to go into today. So I just found this very interesting. Scientists and researchers at institutions, we're, uh, we're in the trenches. We're the ones doing all the cutting edge work. But if you look at this congressional hearing tally uh, that I took from the Chronicle of Higher Education, of 124 people invited to speak uh, to lawmakers to address issues that we all work on, out of them only two were university researchers. Now the question is, are they be not being asked or are they not going? But the fact is we're not getting out there. We're the ones, either maybe we're not, don't, are afraid of communicating effectively, but we're not reaching the, what matters, the public and the policy decision makers. And according to this Harris poll, and somebody was shocked this morning at our, at our workshop, scientists rank among the top six most prestigious occupations. Does that shock anybody here? It does. Uh, because we probably, if you ask, we probably think we've been dropping over the years and nobody listens to us anymore. Everybody's looking at the internet, nobody trusts me, I spend my whole visit seeing patients debunking everything from the internet, but the fact is we're still trusted and the public want to hear from us. And the public definitely needs education. <laughs> so this is the uh, swine flu epidemic, pandemic. This is a sign that hang, hung up on the other side of campus. Stony Brook is cut by a road called Nichols Road. One side is the Health Science Center and the hospital. I actually work on both sides. The other side has the School of Journalism and all the other undergraduate and graduate disciplines. Stony Brook was the first university in the country to get the H1N1 vaccine for their students. And it's a, I don't know if you all are familiar with Stony Brook, but it's a huge science and research institution. And this is the sign that hung up across campus convincing students not to get the vaccine. In fact, Howard Schneider, the dean of the School of Journalism that Val mentioned, teaches a news literacy class. And in that class, he teaches, um, I think it's only undergraduates, how to be news literate, how to dis go through and weigh through all the information that comes through us now in the news to make effective decisions for ourselves. And he asked, I think there was 125, how many of you went and got the vaccine that just arrived on campus last month. And how many people do you think out of the 125 raised their hand? How many? Six. And we were the first university to get this vaccine. Let's roll this videotape and see if anybody saw, ever saw this. Now, this is a story of an amazingly beautiful young woman. She was training to be a pro football cheerleader, and she got a flu shot. She says that shot has destroyed her chances of happiness. We told you about her story last time. Now, Les Trent is with this woman for a first-hand look at what her life has become. All right. 
She's the beautiful cheerleader whose heartbreaking story is shocking the nation. 25-year-old Desiree Jennings showed me how she can't walk without twisting, jerky movements. But she walks backwards normally. Doctors say she has a rare one-in-a-million neurological disorder that was triggered 10 days after she got a seasonal flu shot. Started with me not being able to eat without passing out. You couldn't eat without passing out? I visited Desiree and her husband Brendan at their home in Ashburn, Virginia to see what their daily life is like. She has to go up and down stairs backwards because something as simple as walking forward can be dangerous. So how many people by a show of hands saw this video? I know Chris, the AV guy, saw it. So we have a few hands. So when, when Howard Schneider, the dean, asked why only six of you got vaccinated, a bunch of them raised their hand and saw this video. Some said, my grandmother thinks it's a conspiracy. Answers, you know, I'm going to die from the vaccine. So we're, the public needs education, and, who, and we're at a critical time now. They're getting this information from the internet, from YouTube, and we need to still be there to effectively communicate what's important in the work that we do. How many people were vaccinated? This is actually the president of our university being vaccinated by his daughter, who's a physician at graduation. He's an infectious disease physician. And the year when the H1N1 vaccine was out, only 20% of the overall US population was vaccinated. And nurses at Stony Brook were refusing to get vaccinated. So where is the public, as you can see, getting their information? Uh, the TV and the internet is the primary source. We're not surprised of the science and technology information. But the good news is, again, the public, this will go against the grain. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't believe this till I saw it. But the public does not assume this information is correct. Four out of five of them are looking for reliable answers and to questions that they have regarding what they're viewing on the internet. And they do believe, as leaders, that we're knowledgeable and impartial, and that we can give them these answers. So Val talked about the Center for Communicating Science. And one of the missions of the Center for Communicating Science that Val mentioned is to train scientists, physicians, healthcare providers to be better and more effective communicators. We do this through these types of sessions, but we also give workshops. One of the workshops that I gave this morning is called Distilling Your Message. That is the foundation for effective communication. That's how to frame your work or your message in a clear and effective way and to know your audience. Other workshops we give, and Val will show you later, is improvisation. But we also give workshops on uh, writing, how to be a clear and effective writer, uh, and also media training for TV and, and print interviews. And I give a workshop called Connecting with the Community because we found, especially at Stony Brook, and it's ringing true because I'm going across the country speaking about it, is that scientists um, have trouble connecting with the community for outreach or extension and uh, research purposes. And a lot of grants are uh, requiring community-based participatory research. And these relationships need to be cultivated. And how are they cultivated? I always say it's like dating. You can't get a grant, and then the next day expect the community to jump on board. You have to cultivate these relationships, and it starts with clear and effective communication. Anybody here know about the flame challenge? OK. Well, the flame challenge, Val, you want to talk about the flame challenge? Yeah, we. She was inundated with this. I was inundated with the flame challenge. In fact. We have a star in our midst. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the Flame Challenge, and then I'll introduce him. Um, this was a huge surprise for me this morning. The Flame Challenge um, was an idea of Alan's. He wrote an editorial for Science Magazine um, that challenged scientists all over the world to answer the question that he asked when he was 11, what is a flame? And his science teacher said, it's oxidation. It's completely, you know, wrote him off substituted one word for another word that didn't mean anything. So he gave this challenge to scientists, 
And we had panels of 11-year-old judges from around the planet. We had 6,000 11-year-olds judging the contest. And it was really cool. We got 822 entries. They were screened for scientific accuracy at Stony Brook. And then of those 822, I think 535 went out to schools. And each entry went to three judging schools. And the judging schools had a rubric that they had to judge from and all of this. Um, and coincidentally, I was uh, waiting for Yvonne outside of her session this morning, and our second runner-up, Simon Schreier, ladies and gentlemen, came walking down the hall. So, <laughs> um, he, he did an amazing video with a friend of his that combined great science um, and humor and music, and that really hit home with the students. The surprising thing, really the most surprising thing about the 11-year-olds, we expected that they would want something that was short and sweet so they could get back to their Xbox or their illegal Facebook page. That's what we were assuming. But the surprising thing was that what they really wanted was clear, specific information. And it was great if that information was also entertaining, but that really wasn't, that wasn't the most important thing to them. The most important thing is that they could answer the question, what is a flame? And so uh, we can show a little bit of the... Let, uh, you wanna, this is the winner. This is the winner, a um, guy named Ben Ames. And he, um, he sequestered himself from his, his wife and his child for a week and a half and went down in the basement and made an amazing seven-minute video. We'll show you just a couple of minutes of it so you can get the idea, but it begins with a scientist chained to the walls of hell and ends with kind of a rock and roll theme song. We won't get to the theme song because it's six minutes in, but if you go to the website, the flame, flamechallenge.org, you can see his video and Simon Schreier's also amazing video. But here's this video. Um, excuse me. Pardon me. No, 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 not up there. I'm down here. Yep. Hello. I am a scientist. And I've come to improve your situation just a bit. See that fire over there? Have you ever really wondered what the flames are from that fire? I mean, look at all of those colors. And you feel that heat. It's hot, right? Well, gee. It must be torture being around all these flames and not knowing what they are. Here, take a look at this cupcake. Do you see the flame on top of this delicious looking cupcake? You do like cupcakes, don't you? Let's take a closer look, shall we? Fantastic! If we look at the flame on top of this cupcake, we first notice a few things, like all the colors. At the bottom, we have this bluish color, and the top is more yellow, orange, and reddish. Also, the flame is hot. Why is it so flaming hot? Well, to answer these questions, you need to know something very important. You see, everything is made up of tiny things called atoms. And these things are the building blocks that make up everything. And they're really small. Smaller. Smaller. Even smaller. Hey, look, you can't even see them. They're so small. I know you want to see more, but it's seven minutes long. You could go on the website, and it ends with a really great song. Uh, so this has become bigger than they thought, right? Yeah. And now it's going to be an annual. You want to describe what's going to go yeah, on? Yeah, the, the idea is we didn't know. You know, Alan wrote the article, and um, he gave us 10 days' notice to prepare for an international science contest. Yeah, it was um, a kind of a whirlwind affair. So we didn't know if we would get, you know, 25 entries or 100 entries. We, we didn't really know what we were up against. And, I was, I was thinking, how are we going to get students to judge these? So I'm calling schools and saying, could you, could you get your fifth grade class to judge for us? And they were not tremendously enthusiastic. And then we went on, I, I can't remember what the first news show was. Do you remember? NPR? NPR. I don't remember. There was a big, a big um, public announcement about it. And then suddenly, I have schools from Western Australia, I have schools from China, you know, everybody and their brother wants to be and at And one of um, the participa participants in our workshop this morning, her daughter, 
participated in. Oh, this. really? From a school. Where was the school? Are you here? She's not here. She's not here. Um, maybe Dan's class next year will be a judging panel. But um, the, uh, the idea is, is that this is going to be an ongoing contest, and the judges from this year will vote on what the next question will be. So it won't always be what is a flame. We'll have a new question next year. And some of the entries have started coming in. My favorite, just between us, is what is time? Great, right? I really hope that wins, but you know. Anyway, so we're still taking, um, we're still taking submissions. I'm betting on what that. is a phytopathologist. That's yeah. What I'm That's a really good one, too. I, I think that one's going to win. Okay, so why are we here? Well, like I said, distilling your message is the foundation for effective and clear communication. So that this is the definition, because we all need a definition of what distilling your message is. So it's how to translate science and health messages into understandable words that engage your audience. And like I said this morning, I always forget, but I should highlight in red and bold and capital letters, engage. That's what we're trying to do initially. Again, we're not here to teach you how to dumb down your science. It's opening up the public's ears to want to hear about your science. And how do you do that? You have to engage them. I always use the examples of my children or kids in practice. I'm sure a lot of us have children here and know that when a child wants to know something, they ask questions. When they don't ask a question, it's their way of saying, TMI, I'm just not interested, I can't handle it, I don't understand, I don't care. Does anybody have that, have that experience? With patients, it happens all the time. And that's how we judge, or at least I judge, what information I'll share with the patient. Uh, like I said this morning, I, you know, in my practice in pediatrics, I had a very homogeneous practice. Uh, I had ch uh, children of policemen and firemen. I understood their communities. But I just spoke at Columbia and Cornell to emergency room physicians, and their audience changes minute to minute. They'll have seven patients in seven different gurneys from seven different audiences, I mean, from seven different populations, and they need to know each of their audience and understand what and how to clearly effectively communicate to them. The issue is how do you know? And I always judge it by questions. If somebody wants to know more, they're going to ask. So it's always fair to say you should start in a simple, and I don't, want, I don't like to use the word simple, but in a less detailed way. And then you can add on later. So just so you understand, this is, we're starting with the engagement. You want people to sit up and listen and want to learn more. It's very hard to do that when you start with details and words that they don't understand. So that's the basis of all of this. So the first thing is to know your audience. When before I came here, Val and I spoke with Betty and uh, Nancy. They were probably sick of us, just trying to figure out who was actually going to be here. What percent are from academic institutions? What percent of you uh, have PhDs? What is the work that you do? So we could try. You know, we can't reach each and every one of you, but we'll try to reach the majority of you and to understand who your audience is. And that's the first part of everything you start with, is knowing who you're speaking with so you can better uh, distill your message appropriately. And make sure they understand that's your job. Again, when I vaccinated children, or if they walked out unvaccinated, that was my problem. Um, I always, when I give this speech, I get a few people that say, I've spent my whole career learning this language. It's not my responsibility to translate it. It's their responsibility to try and understand it. Uh, or I wear, I, I get this from the medical students all the time. I was a medical student. I know the mentality. They're wearing the white coat. Why is the community just not listening to me? I am saying this. I got into medical school. They should just listen to me. That is not the way it works in reality, and especially nowadays um, in practice. So I truly believe, and so you know, and we're here to tell you that it's our responsibility to be the effective and clear communicators. Always look for common ground. What you have in common with somebody always makes it easier for them to sit up and listen and feel comfortable and want to engage with you. 
and say what you do and why it matters. It came up a lot in the workshop this morning. Why? Scientists focus on details. That's the way we learn. I spent my whole medical school um, training and residency learning all of these little pieces of the puzzle. And then I realized when I got into practice, I never put that puzzle together. I didn't understand the why, the total picture. And that's what we need to start with. Again, no jargon, be conversational. And this is true even when you're working with other scientists. Again, that example of, of extension and, and uh, outreach. And it's very important when you're giving lectures, I'm sure you've heard this already, when you're even giving interviews to the media, stick to two most three main points because our brains really can't handle much more. And it may be an hour session, but we're hoping you walk out with these two to three main points. So when I put this slide up this morning, I got this huge sigh of relief from the workshop. And the reason is because this is how we learn. Everything I said probably didn't mean much until everybody you know, saw this diagram. So what this says is, on the left in green, is the pyramid is that's how a scientist learns and communicates in general. We talk about the background, we do the supporting details, then we get to the results and conclusions. Well, it's the flip side when you're communicating to the public and, and what should always come first is the why, the bottom line. Then. That's the engaging part. That's what you may, or somebody may call the simple part. But once you engage them, people will stand up and listen. You can then add layers and details. And that's where you get to the so what, and then the supporting details. So a very important thing is the curse of knowledge. This happens to me every day and every time I learn something new. And I'm sure. A show of hands, has anybody, does this, has everybody experienced this in their lives? Where you don't understand something, you finally understand it, and then you can't believe somebody else doesn't understand it. And, and that's a problem when you're trying to teach somebody else because you assume, there's the assumption that they understand. They're at your point, and you, should and you can never assume that. So it's important to avoid the curse of knowledge. There's also the flip side of the curse of knowledge, which is you know it so well, you don't think anybody else will understand it. When I go to see my surgeon, I'm a physician, I've been to him for 30 years, and he still won't answer my question because he doesn't think I'm going to understand it, or he doesn't have the time to explain. But it's mostly he doesn't think I'm going to understand it. OK, you going to be a volunteer to read this? Yeah, we need a reader. Jeffrey, will you read this for us? Bacillus anthracis, the etiologic agent of anthrax, is a large gram-positive, non-modal, spore-forming bacterial rod. The three virulence factors of B. anthracis are edema toxin, lethal toxin, and a capsular antigen. CDC website's facts on anthrax 2001. Okay, so does everybody remember in 2001 the anthrax scare? This is what the CDC posted. To comfort the public. <laughs> okay, this, this is the biggest public health face, right? The communicator to the public. What's wrong with this? Can somebody just yell out or vowel? Jargon. Is anything scary about this? Yeah, so I'm happy to say they've gotten better, OK? But this was pretty scary. So this is what we came up with. Someone want to read it? Should I dress it up a little bit? No, just okay. read it. An anthrax is a disease caused by bacteria. It usually is curable, but can be fatal in animals and people. OK, so this is very simple. But it's not alarming. This is a click away from getting more information if they want it. But this is the engaging, non-threatening message. And if somebody's interested in learning more, there will be more. But this is the initial step. What's the first question that you, I mean, if you were reading this, what, what would be the question that would emerge? Is it really curable? Is it really curable? 
What, you had one too. How, how, could I get it? How, would I get it? how would I get it? Okay. Are there any other questions that come up immediately? Which people? Which people get it, or which people is it fatal in? How you prevent it? So, of all of those questions, would you have a person that immediately came to mind that could answer those questions? Your doctor, right? So it would be it would be a way. If you weren't that worried about it, you go, you go to this, you go, oh, okay, usually curable. That's the thing that I would stick with, right? But for the people who have questions, at least they have a path knowing, oh, I'll call my doctor. Not n spores, non-modal rods. I, I don't even know where to turn with those questions. I'm thinking, should I have paid better attention in middle school science? I don't remember that teacher's name. Who do I even ask? But this... At least you know where to go. It's simple. So we're going beyond the basics now. Sigh of relief, right? We're getting rid of the simplicity. We're first, we've engaged now. And then you're going to introduce the complexity gradually. So you're going to use different levels of complexity for different audiences. And that gets back to knowing your audience. And there are, you know, there are many ways nowadays to learn about your audience. Besides talking to people directly, which not many people do anymore, but that's a really great way of doing it. But the internet's at everybody's fingertips to find out more. Tell a story. What's surprising, exciting, difficult, upsetting, mysterious? You want people to remember what you're saying and be interested and understand it. I guarantee you guys will walk out of here probably not remembering anything, but maybe some of the stories that Val told or some of the stories that I told, those are memorable by, by passion, by feelings, by emotion. We remember things by visual images. And also, the process of science is fascinating to many people. And they want to understand the process that got you to your findings. Why are you so passionate about what you do? People are interested. These are stories, and they love to hear stories. And use examples, anecdotes, and analogies. And I'll give you some more, but we've been using them. Could someone read this out loud? Yeah, go ahead. Right. So, the jellyfish shimmered and glowed. With its tendrils retracted, it looked like a round bar of glycerin soap, or maybe a translucent diaphragm and it felt equal parts firm, jiggly, and slimy, like a slice of liver coated in raw egg. So this is Natalie Angier, who I mentioned earlier. What did you think of this? Cool. <laughs> Any other comments? Cool. I just said it's very descriptive. Not really appetizing. Not appetizing. So you wouldn't read the New York Times while you're eating. Very uh, visual, and she used terms that people are familiar with. Probably even if you've never held a jellyfish or a piece of liver, you still know what it feels like, right? Just from the description of those things. And the visual images are important. They stick with you. I mean, I'm a visual learner, and I will remember that more than I remember what I read. So use comparisons. Who read... Uh, the book by Rebecca Skloot, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Fabulous, fabulous book. I recommend it. Uh, Rebecca Skloot is a, 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 I don't think it was New York Times, but she's a journalist, and she wrote this book. And uh, it's about the first cells to be immortal and commercialized. Uh, and she was on the Colbert Report. And she was trying to describe how many cells came from this one cell. And this is what she said. Does somebody want to read it? If you gather all the cells that grew from that one little sample, they would weigh more than 50 million metric tons, more than 150 Empire State Building. So what do you think of that? I like that she doesn't just leave with 50 million metric tons, because even that is obscure. We just don't get that. But somehow we can put in our minds 150 M Empire State Building, so something more concrete. We can get that more. I mean, we're assuming everybody knows what the Empire State Building well, is. Well, that's true. That's an assumption. But what she's doing here is she's making these comparisons so we can understand how 
many this is. It's a huge number. And the public are mostly not numbers people. And they cannot understand the size and magnitude of a number. So if you put it into context like this, something memorable, they'll understand it. And emotional is memorable. Emotion is memorable. Don't be afraid. In medicine, it's an issue. You know, we're not told not to be emotional, but it happens. And there's always the appropriate time and place to show emotion and share stories. And, um, and I think the art, my field is gearing a little more in that direction, thank goodness. It's OK. It's OK to be a little personal. People will remember that. Uh, there are studies out there that uh, physicians that make medical errors are less likely to be sued if they share with their patients their vulnerability. They may, may, may have made a mistake. Uh, they share their concern. If they don't admit it, they're more likely to get sued. And that's a personal connection that, that physicians should be making. So again, simplifying does not mean dumbing down. And um, you can focus on the meaning and rather than the details and add the details later. And we keep saying this because we don't want you leaving here thinking that we're asking you to put what you've learned all these years in a simple sentence because nobody can do that. But it's important for you to engage your listeners if you want your work that you're so passionate about to be understood and get out there to the public or whoever you're targeting, your students, the legislators. So has anybody read Michael Pollan's book? OK. He made a very big mistake and tried to dis How many pages is that book, would you say? Just yell it out. I can't hear. Yeah, something like that, between three and 400. And he decided, you know what, I'm going to synthesize my book, distill it into seven words. And this is what he came up with. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Now, whoever read the book, does that sum it up? Well, his sales for his book went way down after he did this. <laughs> Who wants to read 400 pages when you can understand, when you can read seven words? Aha! Something I understand. What is a plant pathologist? Is the author of this in the audience? <laughs> Stand up and take a bow. I'm coming. <laughs> is he reading part of this? Yeah. OK. OK, so this is the definition that's on the website <laughs> that. Why do I feel I'm being set up? <laughs> <laughs> That he's proud, to, you're proud to say you've written part of it. Yes. Can you read it for us? A plant pathologist is a professional who specializes in plant health much as a physician specializes in human health or a veterinarian in animal health. Keeping plants healthy requires an understanding of the organisms and agents that cause disease, as well as an understanding of how plants grow and are affected by disease. Through college courses in botany, microbiology, crop science, soil science, ecology, genetics, biochemistry, <laughs> microbiology, biology, and physiology, students receive the necessary background for exciting careers in interdisciplinary science of plant pathology, most specialized by taking advanced college training for master's and doctoral degrees. Plant pathologists are employed by colleges, universities, state and federal governments, agencies, industrial firms, and international institutes, and as private practitioners. Oh, wait a sec. I forgot to introduce you. Does everybody know Dr. David Godori? OK. So in communication is very important to you. You're the internal communications officer for APS. Also a plant pathologist at Cornell. What, can we just get some comments? What's missing? What's not missing? What's great about this? It's true. OK. OK. It's factually correct. What else? Here we go. That's, Joan important. That's very important. I think it goes back to really being important to know your audience. It's great for an audience that understands most of the terminology there. But wait a minute. 
Are we trying to tell a plant pathologist what a plant pathologist is? No, I'm thinking, I'm thinking maybe a high school student who's interested in science would be able to understand this, but other people might not. It depends on the audience. So by a show of hands, do we think high school students can understand this? How many high school students would want to become a plant pathologist after reading this? I think that that first sentence. I heard that already from you about the vet. I'm sorry, I go ahead. I think the first sentence really says it all. It basically gets your, your attention, and it basically says, says who we are in, in very engaging terms and in very simple terms. Yeah, the first sentence is great, right? It, it, um, it relates it to somebody, something everybody knows, right? But what happens as we go on and on and on and on? <laughs> Yvonne Sheen has something to say that may be different. Who? Too much detail, I think. And to put all the dictionary together, uh, it could be intimidating for the young people. They're probably scared out. <laughs> and the other thing is uh, exciting. That's a good word, but you got to let your audience feel exciting. How you sell your idea, this exciting career. Uh, I don't know. I don't get it from here. And what is the, who is the, who is the target of this? This is on the website, right? He has a great voice, doesn't he? I was going to say radio. he should be a radio announcer. Said this before, but I've got the face for radio too. <laughs> <laughs> and he's humble. Actually, the audience for this was um, a, an undergraduate research conference. So this was targeted at uh, people that were fairly advanced in their undergraduate education at the college level. So th I'll say that in my defense. <laughs> but that was the, the choir. That was the original intention. But why was it put on the website? for the uh, website, that's, that's a major part of our expected audience. Oh, okay. What is it? Is it missing anything besides being a little long and detailed? I just wanted to add one thing. With that being the target audience, I think it really does give them a good idea of what they need to, to do. They could have maybe finished with a little bit more excitement, but I think it, for the audience who was targeting for it, it might have been appropriate. Okay. What if, though, we're changing the audience now? Is it missing anything um, for the high school student or somebody in college looking into the field? It's far too detailed. And really, at that stage, I'm just trying to get them interested in the plants. This is years in their future. Mm -hmm. Mm. But is it missing anything for anybody, any audience? What? Exactly. It's, it's missing the so what. That's it's right. It's missing the we're going to we're going to improve world hunger. Exactly. Plants get sick. What did you say? But why does that matter? Why does it matter that we make these plants better? For undergrad college students, the second sentence should be about who employs you. <laughs> True. Anybody else? Yeah, hold on. I'm really glad I wore heels today. <laughs> For any audience, it's missing the hook. This is a what? It's missing the hook. What's the hook? To get them interested in it. Well, what, what interests you? That uh, it makes a difference, that it can really uh, have an impact. Exactly. Like, like uh, curing disease or... or making food more abundant. And in journalism, we call that hook the angle. Anything could be newsworthy if you got the angle. The reason why it matters today to you at this moment, that's what people want to hear. They, why, why do you pick up the newspaper and why do you get past the first paragraph and continue reading? Most of the stuff is because how is it impacting you and why should you care? And that's what goes in the lead, L-E-D-E, -E, of an article, the first paragraph of a news article. Everybody's heard of the who, what, why, where, when, and how. The why is really important, and that's what this is missing. 
because what you guys do is so important and impacts our lives on many, many, many levels. And somebody said in our workshop today, it's in the clothes we wear. It's, you know, these are examples that people will understand. Go ahead. I am not a plant pathologist, and, uh, but even though my partner is, I understand it. But as a lay person, to me, what it's missing is uh, the passion. Um, it's stating factual statements, which is good, but instead it needs to be personalized. Um, why it's important to the plant pathologist uh, for keeping uh, plants healthy and what it does for me, um, why I would want to either care about it or become more involved in it. And so I think that's the major thing in relating to the average person, why it's important but use it as a we or a my uh, reasons mm -hmm. instead of just, okay, those are really good. Once you get to the education, then you've lost them. They're going to say, are you kidding me? Um, but exactly that's what you need, passion. And what comes along with the why is often passion because the why did you go into this field is because you were passionate about it, right? There's something that drew you into it. Thank you. So this is what we came up with. It could be much better, but um, a way to at least relate the why a little. And this is before I really learned even more in the workshop today about how important your work is. I would change this and make it even better. Um, someone want to just read it briefly and maybe add to it now that we're experts? specializes in plant health, just like a physician specializes in human health or a veterinarian in, in animal health. Plants get sick with diseases the same way people and animals do. It's important to keep plants healthy in order to protect our food supply, economy, environment, soil, and water resources, and the health of workers in farms, gardens, and landscapes. So this could be a little more passionate if I understood what you guys did before I got here a little better. And um, any other suggestions on how to make it better? I have one. Hold on, I'll get to you in a sec. I, I guess that most people, um, when they think of a veterinarian or doctor, human doctor, they can picture them working in a clinic. But most people don't know where we work or what it looks like. And I think that's missing. Would you talk about that or show a picture? Yeah. That's a very good point. Plant pathologists love their work. There is nobody that I talk to that is as passionate about their work. We wake up in the morning, uh, two in the morning sometimes, running to the lab, right? And so this is what's missing from this. And, mm -hmm. and people that are reading this, they don't get that. And we get it. So that's... So what would you say? Okay, what I say to students who are in this position, I say, do you know people who hate to go to work in the morning? I have never been that person. Mm. Oh, that's great. So maybe you just say something like, well, I don't know, I, plant, path, you know plant pathologists are in love with what they do or passionate about what they do because it's, you know, the reason why. And I must say, I agree with you, from the workshop this morning, it was evident to me how passionate everybody is about their work, and you don't find that everywhere. So that is an important point to bring out. I, I distill it down even further. This actually just happened, I think it was yesterday morning, this morning at the hotel. And uh, somebody asks what I do, and I say, well, my job is to keep plants healthy so that they, the consumer, can have a safe, healthy, and affordable food supply. Let's just leave it at that. Yeah. That's good. It has the why and why it should matter. I like those statistics, too, that Carol threw in at the beginning because that scared me, and that's effective. <laughs> yeah, numbers, and yeah. if you say them effectively. Yeah. So here it is. What do you actually do? Does someone want to read this out loud? 
I study the effects of plant secondary compounds on herbivory. What does that mean? <laughs> Someone want to explain it? Can you explain it? This is actually something, I think this was from one of the workshops we gave. Somebody said that. Not here, not here. Nobody in this audience. Because of time, I'm going to, go ahead, you want to give it a try? Sure. Um, I guess I would say I study the effects of plant defense chemicals on animals or insects that eat them. Is that right? I don't know. Is it right? I'm an actor. I, you know, I'm the public. Who wants to Post read this one? Let's get somebody in the middle. Have you ever wondered why certain plants taste really bitter? It's because they produce the, these bitter compounds to protect their leaves from being eaten. This explains why certain plants are eaten more than others. How's that? So what kind of technique was used in this from what we spoke about already? Did someone say comparison? Personal? Is that what you were going to say? I can't hear. Sorry. It starts with a question. question. Yeah. What else? Engaging, easy to relate to. And why is it common ground, right? Have you ever wondered? Because I've wondered. OK, I'm going to give you one quick example of unrelated to um, your work, but kind of a little related. Uh, I have lots of examples, but we're running out of time, and there's some fun stuff I want to show you. Um, this was a lecture I just gave at Cornell Emergency Room Medicine I mentioned already. One of the um, authors, Lemery, uh, organized this Grand Rounds. And he's a wilderness physician. And I wondered why he wanted me to come speak on communication when he deals in the wilderness where there's nobody to communicate with. <laughs> that was a challenging audience. <laughs> I tried to figure that one out. Uh, someone who want to read this? Got it. This is from a paper. Now, this is addressed to um, academic people, so it's the right audience for this type of language. But what's interesting is we haven't sold the message on global warming, right, to the public. So I use this as an example of how can we take this information and make the public aware of how important global warming is. So if somebody wants to read this, and then I'll give you the example, Here we go. the distilled the message. The global population is expected to increase to 9 billion by 2050, essentially a 25% increase in just 40 years. That means more automobiles, more toxins, and more and pollutants, and increased stress on clean water and arable land. The environmental impact of this population surge will affect most communities on the planet and will threaten the well-being of billions through shifting patterns of disease, extreme weather events, food and water insecurity shelter vulnerability, and population migration. Now, was this successful in letting the public know why should I care about global warming? Why does it matter to me? This is what we came up with. It could always be better, but who wants to read this? Do you want to read it? No, she doesn't want to read it. Who wants to read it? The population is growing so fast that by 2050, you will be sharing the Earth with 2 billion more people than in 2010. That increase will be like adding the entire population of the United States, more than six times over. Adding so many people so quickly is likely to change your environment, health, and way of life. More cars and more pollution will cause more dangerous weather, including storms and droughts. It will bring health problems, including contagious diseases and breathing problems. As billions more people compete for clean water, food, and land, millions of families may be forced to move in order to survive. So what do we think of that in comparison? It's much better. What makes it better? Uh, it's more engaging, and is, I like the second half where the long sentences are broken up into three distinct 
um, reasons. So we're making them understand how it impacts their daily life, right? Okay, we have more, plenty more examples, but I'm going to move on because okay. Brian, who's heard of Brian Greene? He's a really effective, in our opinion, communicator. Hold on one second, Yvonne. We had one, one woman wanted to oh. comment. I just don't think it's all factual. You're stating it like it's fact, and you don't know. That was the previous. That it, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. that. Go back to that. If I can figure that out. Nope. Oh, one further. Okay. One more. This is, to me, this, you don't know this, and you're stating it like it's fact. And I would disagree with a lot of it. Well, I was basically Here, Here's the problem with that, though, right? Is that politicians are stating fact that there is no global warming. And they're stating that as fact. It's outlawed to teach global warming in two states now. Fact. No, this is the health effects of global warming. No. And the other, the other piece is politicians are not sticklers for facts. You're talking to a bunch of scientists. Right. <laughs> that politicians are not, don't care about facts at all, but the problem is, is the public listens to the, what the po politicians are saying. So the, that therein lies the problem. It's the... If, re if you repeat the same three things over and over again, it doesn't matter whether they're factual enough or at all. It just, they stick. So we have to figure out a way so that the message of science can stick in the same way. So I guess what you're saying is that um, to, uh, for scientists to effectively communicate to the public, we need to reduce a little bit our level of natural skepticism for the degree of rigor with which we decide that something is truly factual. And that, th to me, this is an example of paying, taking what many of us scientists would consider speculation and making it sound a little bit more factual so that we can get the point uh, across that our predictions for the future that may be based on facts okay, but what are useful. Okay, I, I hear you, but what, we're, what I want to make a point no, is this sorry. is his opinion right. in an article that he wrote. So this is the way he would communicate what he believes in a clear, more clear, it, it's not, I should have made that clear. I'm not saying that we're going to, you know, I know this is a hot issue. I, giving scientists a little bit of license to express personal opinions. Well, that it is because it's from yes, an editorial. Yes, but many of us are trained to never, ever, ever, right. ever do that. Right. Right. So you, got, you need to communicate that to scientists also. Right. Good. Very good point. Yeah, great point. Okay. Oh, sorry. Because that's also held against scientists, isn't it? Yeah. Scientists Absolutely. don't even know. Right? Yeah. Right. So this is the problem. Yes. We're going against the grain. Yeah. Part part of the deal too is that the right. Very good point. When you're talking to the public, period. That's when. Hold on. I think we're talking about paradigm shift. Yeah. When, when we were are trained as a, as a scientist, we were told you have to be logical and to be cool-headed, never speculate unless you have evidence. Yeah. However, when you're talking about when we speak to public, yes. we have to use a different kind of standard. But the key is we should not lose our professional standard. So you should not tell purposely lies. And you mentioned about politicians. Usually, p people don't believe politicians. So even if they say three times, and then we should not, as a scientist, I agree with you, say we should not down, down, down our, uh, our standards. But the thing is, you should use different language yeah. yes. to convey the truth. Right. That's yes. what we're here for. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And people want to listen to you. They don't want to listen to legislators, right? 
So and, and, we, we have their ear. And while nobody trusts politicians, we still vote them in. We don't have a choice, Val. We have a choice. All right, let's get back. Watch Colbert. We're getting really hot here on a completely different topic. <laughs> Whew, I gotta get off. <laughs> uh, Ryan Green, great communicator. Well, I want you guys to take a listen to this, and then we'll talk about some of the stuff we spoke about that he uses. Let's go to the videotape. Our guest tonight is a physics professor at Columbia University and one of the top minds in superstring theory. But you know, until they engage in our national debate, I don't trust subatomic particles. Please welcome the author of The Elegant Universe, Mr. Brian Greene. Forgive me, there. I, I called you Mr. It's that doctor. Works. Is works. it doctor? It is doctor, but it is doctor. Works. What is What is your actual doctor in? In theoretical physics. Okay. <laughs> now, specifically, your interest and your, your, your area of expertise is string theory. That's right. Now, um, but to understand string theory, I understand we also have to understand quantum mechanics. That's true. And uh, really understand that, we probably should have a working knowledge of relativity. If that would help. Okay. <laughs> So, explain those three real quick. Sure. <laughs> what, what is string theory? People hear about it. It's very hot. Yeah. It's a theory that tries to realize a dream that Albert Einstein had for 30 years, but never found. It was a dream of a unified theory of physics, a single idea, single equation that might possibly describe everything in the universe, the big, the small, and everything in between. What, is, what are these little strings? Are we, talking, yeah. little, are we literally talking about strings yeah. here? So the idea of the theory is that we are in but fact. But that makes sense. I mean, everything, everything's round in the world. It looks like, round. This is round. The globe is round. That's right. Your but, head is round. Why would something be string-shaped? Well, if you follow the mathematics of this theory, it Which tells I won't. us. Go ahead. Okay, yes. good. <laughs> it suggests that if you were to examine the structure of matter on tiny, tiny scales, it would look different from the matter we see in everyday life. Can we life. do that? Can we go examine it? Can we look at it? Uh, not as small as we'd like in order to see the strings So we themselves. can't actually physically look and prove that this is true uh, or not, not true? Yet. Absolutely okay. Not yet. Absolutely not. So you can just say things and not have to prove it. Uh, we could. <laughs> What's that but, like? That, that's right. But here's the thing. The mathematics of the theory has to make sense, mm -hmm. and the theory has to embrace previous discoveries like relativity and quantum mechanics mm -hmm. in a sensible way. That is a huge requirement mm -hmm. that any theory has to pass, no, what, and what, you can't what, just say anything because of that. Well, you can't? No, you can't. Well, you okay. can try. Uh, yeah, how about, I'll say something crazy. Okay. Uh, uh, strings exist in two dimensions at once. See, that wouldn't work. That, would, that wouldn't be compatible with relativity. You no? Know? Yeah. Well, yeah. What, 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 don't these strings have crazy uh, properties? Like they're curled up inside uh, themselves? Well, they're tiny little loops yes. of vibrating energy. And the vibrating strings look like the vibrating strings on a violin or a cello. So you're, but they're really you're tiny. You're kidding me. They literally are, look like, if we could look, this it is, would be a string. It's not a metaphor. It's a string. The idea is Attached that literally, to what? that's right, attached to itself. So it could have ends that would be attached to space itself or loops that have no ends that would vibrate in space. Now do you Vibrating see why people you like existence. intelligent design? Well... <laughs> you see, it just seems easier than that, you know? I mean, Occam's razor tells us that the simplest answer is usually the right one, well, here, which is well, easier to understand. That or it just happened. Well, here's the thing. <laughs> It's definitely easier to follow your answer. Thank you. But we have learned, we have learned that our sense of what's right and wrong needs to be dictated by data, by observations, by cold study of the facts. And relativity and quantum mechanics make predictions. By that what's it, right and wrong? Yeah, that helps to use that as a, as a judgment. Facts? Absolutely. Let me give you an example. I'm not a big fan of facts. Yeah, let me just give one thing. <laughs> quantum mechanics can make a prediction for the properties of a little particle called an electron. You probably know of I've it. I've heard of them, it's, yeah. It's got magnetic properties. Right. Quantum mechanics makes a prediction 10 decimal places long regarding the magnetic properties. You do the experiment, and the experiment agrees with the calculation to those 10 decimal places. That is an incredibly convincing piece of evidence that these ideas are taking us toward truth. They're not made up, they're not pulled out of a hat, they're telling us about the true nature of the world. So you're saying, I, I descended from a monkey? Uh, I, I didn't actually say that. No, um, but you're implying. Uh, oh. By saying that science has more validity than what I feel, you're implying I descended from a monkey. Face it. Well, 
If, if, if you don't like the idea, if you don't like the idea, th th that's right. Uh, <laughs> what we have learned, the universe doesn't care much about our tastes. I don't care for the universe. Uh, <laughs> the feeling is mutual. <laughs> I'd change a few things. Last night's sunset, a little more red. Yeah, I, I saw it. I'd agree with you on that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've heard I've heard that there there like there's a possibility that in string theory that there are multiple universes being created at any you know single moment. It's an idea that comes into the yeah. theory, also comes into theories of cosmology. So that there may could be, be multiple us at this moment. Uh, there is a theory that says something akin to that that we're having an interview in a different number universe. of us. Something? The interview is different right. in these other universes. In but could some other universe, could I have nailed you just now? Uh, I just heard that you did from the other one. Oh really? Yeah. Maybe I nailed you in this universe. You did indeed. <laughs> Would you please come back? So what do we think? What, what did, what, why is he a great, first of all, his topic may be a little more difficult than phytopathology. What do you think? Maybe they're the same. But he had a real challenge, and also Colbert is a tough, tough person to be interviewed by, right? For many reasons. Uh, but what do you think? How do you do? What, what, what te techniques make him a great communicator? Or maybe you don't think he is, and tell me why. Smiled and stayed calm. Quick thinker. Animated, passionate. Kept the details down, used analogies. Wait, say that again, detail? Kept the details down, just used in analogies. Okay. Stayed on message. Knew his audience. Do his interviewer. Common ground, right? Maybe he started out with Einstein, right? Mm -hmm. um, getting back to his point, whoever said that, Colbert makes that difficult, right? But he kept going back to his point and going back to his point because he had some points he wanted to get out. If you want practice, you should go on Colbert. It doesn't, it doesn't get much harder. Right. So was anybody lost? The fact is, Colbert said at the beginning, T teach as a joke, right? Tell me everything there is to know, like we're supposed to even learn it in, in a five minute interview. But the point is, we wanted to engage people. Maybe this will convince people, well, maybe I want to know more about this. Or listen up and, you know, I think Carol has a. They did acknowledge the impossibility of sharing all of that information in a short period of time. Even though he couldn't explain everything, he came off being a credible spokesperson in this area. And I thought that was really valuable. And what made him credible? To because, us, his... Because to, to the public, I think he's, he remained credible because he, um, he kept the message simple. He didn't try to explain too much, but he explained enough to, in a simplified way, that we could trust him. And a lot of people know who he is. I mean, that helps. He's got a little advantage. So everybody has heard, if you can't explain something to a six-year-old, you really don't understand it yourself. But you probably don't know who said it. And um, this is true not only with communicating to the public, but it's so true when you're lecturing you know, to a group of students. And so often, we, we can't explain it ourselves. So why does this all matter? Carl, does anybody know who Carl Safina is? He's um, actually co-chair of the Center for Communicating Science. He's a marine ecologist. He has many other titles. Uh, and he's written many, many books. Uh, uh, do you know any of the titles? Um, Lazy, Lazy, Lazy Point. Point. And uh, yeah. He was one of the experts called in for the uh, for the uh, BP oil spill, right? BP oil MacArthur spill. MacArthur Genius Award. He likes to lord that over us. Yeah. So.
So this is what he says. If you choose not to communicate what you do, your work will be increasingly irrelevant. Even worse, you will condemn the rest of us to receive information from sources who may be ignorant or who would seek to distort or misinform their, for their own gain. He's stressing the importance that we communicate. And what can we do? Well, we've told you about the Center for Communicating Science. There's brochures out there. There's many workshops that we give. Um, we also have institutions that are signing up as affiliates because our goal is in, in these workshops, I um, actually am teaching the first medical school curriculum in the country in communicating science. And uh, th we give them a, you know, a sampling of these type of workshops that I'm talking about. But also is we would like this education to be infiltrated into the education, graduate science education across the country. So at Stony Brook, the um, students in atmospheric and marine sciences are required to take communicating science courses as part of their master's and PhD. And this is now happening at other institutions across the country. Uh, Cincinnati and many other institutions are signing on, and they will learn the curriculum and how to teach it and, spre and spread it through their institutions. Um, also, it's very important, like I said, we people do want to hear what scientists have to say. So to be public advocates and, um, and help out in, ex in extension and outreach. And part of what I also teach is um, letters to the editor or uh, op-ed pieces. Get the word out. You know, you're in the trenches and what you say matters and people do want to hear it. Don't be discouraged. And again, don't forget don't be afraid to talk to the press. I know it's very intimidating. And this is a segue into Val's improv. So let's see the videotape. The method that, I, that has been developed in my lab is called neutral atom lithography. We shoot neutral atoms at a sample. The neutral atoms deposit their internal energy onto the sample, changing the sample, and then allowing it again to be developed, much in the same way as photography, you expose film and then develop it. Pretty much, no, they don't, they, they don't interact with a lot of things because they don't have a charge. And the biggest thing we have floating around is electric fields. It's electric fields are, again, this particle, field, wave particle duality. The, the wave part is typically an electric field. And so it's what we use to uh, run our radios, it's what, the, what current runs through the wall, and so these neutral atoms don't interact with the current in the wall. So it's really nice. You can have a very, very tight control over what they do because they don't interact with everything else that's going on. The one thing that they do interact with is a specific kind of light that's tuned exactly to the atom. And what's really elegant about this uh, li neutral atom lithography is that instead of, so with photography and with photolithography, you're shooting light through matter to make a pattern. And here we're shooting matter through light and ultimately making a pattern. In particular, I study a um, group of compounds called phthalate diesters. Um, and they're basically a plasticizer. So what that means is that you can add these compounds to a hard plastic like PVC pipe. Um, PVC is um, polyvinyl chloride, which is their main application. So if you add it to that hard plastic, it then enables it to be more pliable. And it can then be um, turned into a variety of products that we use in our everyday life. Um, examples include baby toys, um, IV bags, um, food packaging. It can also be added as an additive to stuff like um, household cleaners, pesticides, fingernail polish. This is, this is something that you care about. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you care about it in a personal way, I take it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be working on it. So really let that come out. Okay. Um, if all you can think back to when you were a baby, um, your favorite baby toy, chances are um, it's plastic or some sort of plastic. Um, and as you can all imagine, a little three-year-old or a little two-year-old running around with the toy. Um, most make it more personal. <laughs> same idea, same idea. How could you make that more personal? Um, if you had a baby and you... Why, why us? Why not you? Okay, I have a baby at home. <laughs> <laughs> And he has tons and tons of toys, and all of them are plastic. And in this plastic, a lot of times, is a compound called phthalate diesters. And these are, these are plasticizers that make this toy into the little um, boulders or whatever it is that my son wants it to be. And when he sticks that, um, that bulldozer or that squishy toy into his mouth, these phthalates can move out of that squishy toy and into his mouth. 
Um, in the same way, these, these phthalates are used to make all kinds of products that we use every day. Um, and in the same way, they move out of that product and into us, into our toilets, our showers. Um, and they move um, through the sewage system and into the marine environment. And that's where I come in. So for those who don't know, that was Alan Alda. Val, yeah. the fun I, begins. What did you... Uh, what, did, what, did you, what differences did you see from the beginning, the before, the improv, and to the after? Were there differences that you observed? <laughs> she had a baby. And she looks great. Enthusiasm, yeah. Passion, yeah. What else? Confidence. Uh, connecting. What the language? How did the language change? Body language, yeah. Eye contact, uh huh. What else? Simplified. Was it dumbed down? Yeah. I think that's the big thing, isn't it? Because we're so afraid of being accurate that we feel like if we're not using the big words, that it's not. It doesn't honor it or something. It's not living up to the work. But it's, if you simplify it, then the work can land with people and they can actually hear it. Um, so we're going to do just a couple of, of um, improv exercises that we did that really have to do with, um, with knowing your audience and also coming from a very personal place. One of the things that I encounter in um, the improv exercise or the improv workshops that I do is um, what, what do we do if we're going into an adversarial audience or an audience that we know is not going to appreciate us or whatever? And so we work on um, the person coming into the room. We, we play it as a scene, coming into the room and working with the scene partner first. And the person coming into the room is the only one that knows what the relationship is. And by the way that they're communicating, the other person in the scene has to pick up on the signals that they're being given and start to become that relationship. And so this is an example of that exercise. If Rick and Rubella would come up and we'll play out a little scene here. And we'll do it. Um, Yvonne, can we get your lanyards so they have... Um, can we do this, Chris, that we just bop our lan lanyards onto them? Is that okay? Okay, so uh, Rick will be the guy coming into the room and Rebella will be the other person. And um, so I'll tell him what the relationship is, but she won't know. You want to do a little test on their sound? Say something. A little sound test. I really have no... Ooh. Okay. Can you yeah. do a little sound test? Yes. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Is this okay? You don't have to do that. It's here. Oh, okay. Can, Can we all you hear? hear me? Okay. All right. So, Rubella will be in the room, and I'll just take a second and talk to Rick. He'll come in and talk to his work as though he's talking to the person in this relationship. Oh, we're going to do this without her hearing. Yeah, I know. We have to turn our mics off for a second. Is it? <laughs> this is not rehearsed at all. Don't blame me. I have no idea. <laughs> Still hear me? Yeah. Hi, how are you feeling today? Good, thank you. You look good. You look really good. Feeling much better. Good, good. Did you have dinner yet? No, I just want to get something for myself. Oh, you are? Mm -hmm. They're not bringing it to you? I'm pretty bored of hospital food. Yeah. I don't yeah. even like to choose anything. Do they give you any kind of special diet or anything? Or? So I'm trying to get it from somewhere. Don't tell them, please. He'll adjust your mic for you. You can just do some acting. 
They have had me on a liquid diet. Oh. I hate it. I'm don't tell them, okay? That. I'm no, having, I won't tell them. I won't tell I'm having them my nine-year-old sneak some bars for me. <laughs> Let's have go you, into talking about the work a little bit to this person. I'm sorry, say it again? Can you talk to her about the work a little, your work a little bit? Tell her what you're Oh, yeah. Doing. Let me tell you about my new job. So I got this new job. Cool. And, uh, Congratulations. It's all, yeah, thanks. It's really fun. Mm -hmm. It's really fun. I'm really enjoying it. I get to travel a lot. Great. Uh, I get to, uh, to go out spot, outside, spend a lot of time outside. Mm -hmm. Have you been outside for a while? No, I've been stuck in the house. Yeah. Good, okay. So what is what is the relationship that you perceive based on the way that he's talking to her? Son and, Son and a mother, okay. Anybody else? How's mom doing? Not so yeah, not so well. What did you get? What was the relationship that you got, Isabella? Initially, it seemed like he was visiting some elderly relative or a friend. <laughs> Who has a nine-year-old son, unfortunately, but, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. but something of that order. Yeah, okay, good. And we get that not only from what he's saying, but more from the way that he's saying it, right? From his body language, tone of voice, just all of those human connections that we make organically. We don't even think about it, right? We know that this is the relationship, and so organically, we as human beings make this change that this is the way you're gonna go in to talk to this person. Now, let's flip it, and we'll do a different relationship. Hey, Rebella, how's it going? Good, thank you. Good. So what have you been working on lately? I've had this project on um, some root rot diseases. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. Have you thought about the project that, uh, uh, that uh, you did in the past a few years ago to see if it, would, uh, it, it has any merit to it at all? Are you talking about the one to do with wheat? Yeah, that one. <laughs> no, it has, it has, it has, it has had a lot of impact, yeah, you know, yeah. there have been companies have picked it up and they're looking into developing some new chemicals around that work. Great, great. Well, I was thinking about that. I wanted to get you know, your ideas and your thoughts on that to see if, uh, uh, you know, if it has any real merit to it. Good. Okay. What's the relationship we get now? Colleague. Okay. What else? Department head, advisor. Right? Okay, and what did you get from it, Rebel? I'd say a colleague. Yeah. A colleague. A colleague. I'm still weighing whether he's senior or I'm senior. Yes. So. <laughs> I was going to take you there on the next time. <laughs> he's definitely senior. <laughs> I'll remember that, Lawrence. <laughs> the idea of it, did you see the movie Field of Dreams? You know, this saying, if you build it, they will come. And that's kind of the idea of this exercise, is that you go in to deliver the speech and you have the relationship in mind. You know what, who these people are, all right? And watch how they become that based on the way that you're talking to them. So if you go in with the assumption that you're speaking to an adversarial crowd, all of that is just organically going to happen to you. You'll come in defensively, you'll come in apologizing, whatever but it's your response to it that is gonna define what's happening in the audience. So defining a relationship, part of it is knowing your audience, right? You need to know who it is that you're talking to so you can speak to them in a way that they understand. But it's also taking control of that so that you're, you have an ability to speak to people in a way that empowers you. And if that happens, if you're empowered when you're speaking to the other person, the other people will take on the relationship of colleagues or people that you automatically respect. There's a kindness and a human interaction that you don't need to manipulate. 
It just organically happens. It's who we are as human beings and, and what our nature just does. So this is one example. I want to just share one. We can give a little round of applause for our talked about um, adding emotion into, Yvonne, could you give me a hand here? Maybe you could, uh, Jerry, do you want to come up? And we talked about um, bringing emotion um, into the work and how important that is, that we can see the passion of the phytopathologist who's up at 2 o'clock in the morning racing to the lab, you know? But, but we're taught as scientists, or you are taught as scientists, not to allow your own emotion to influence the work. I mean, this is right. You don't want the results of an experiment determined based on your personality. They have to be based on facts. But when we talk to the public, it's so important to bring that human element back in. Um, so one of the exercises we do is called the picture exercise. And um, we start with um, a picture. Just giving you a little background. A picture. This is the picture. It's pretty blank, right? But this is what the public sees. This is what we know. So it's up to the scientist, or in this case, Jerry, the son to fill us in to what the picture is. And we start with a personal picture, and then we move that into a, a picture about your work. But Jerry's just gonna tell us about his picture. You wanna do a little test with your mic? Test, 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 test. Okay, we can hear him, right? Okay. Okay, this is a recent, uh, a recent picture for me. A very, uh, we were asked to pick a favorite picture, and I picked this one. This is a picture of my father in his mid-30s, probably 35, well, let's just say my age. And it's a picture of a picture, so it's a little fuzzy. And, uh, wow, <laughs> what I really like about this picture is that it shows him at an age that I never got to meet him. I really didn't get to know him until I was in high school, and by then, he was in his mid to late 60s. And so what I like seeing from this is that you can see his big ears, which I think I have, the bushy eyebrows, he has a full head of hair, I like that. It, <laughs> it gives me hope that he still had that at 60. And it, it's really interesting to see my father, who I really wanted to know at an early age, and actually see a picture of him and what he looked like in his mid-30s and imagine what that relationship might have been like. And it's also interesting to see that uh, he has this dead deer at the bottom. He was heavily into hunting, and that was something I didn't realize. And it's something I would have had no concept of. I'm not a hunter at all, and it's a completely new part of the relationship that I just didn't have before. And that's why this is my newest, uh, most favorite picture. the picture, the picture is completely irrelevant. What we want to see is the, re the reaction that the person has to the picture and that emotional connection. And what we do during the course of the workshop is we go through first the picture, an emotional picture that means something to you from your life. And then we go and we think about a picture of your work that is equally emotional. And so Sally had an exciting um, picture that she shared yesterday. She's got a mic. Test, test, test. Okay. This is my favorite work picture. I took this a couple years ago in Jasor, Bangladesh. See, here's the farmer. It's a young man, young farmer, and he's standing in front of his house. And I was in Jasor because for a long time I've been working in Bangladesh uh, as a, uh, a consultant, really, on integrated pest management and vegetable crops. And 
you all know what integrated pest management is about. And what we're supposed to be doing in, 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 in uh, integrated pest management is reducing or eliminating the use of unnecessary chemicals and helping farmers to produce healthy and abundant food. So what we're often doing is not just reducing pesticide use, but helping these farmers find solutions to problems they didn't, couldn't control by any means. And so one day when we were leaving one of our field trials uh, in, uh, in Jessore, this young man came running up to the car and he wanted to stop us and he wanted us to see something. And he said, please come out. Uh, of course, through our interpreter. He said, please come out and look. And he said, this is my house. And he said, because I learned about the things that you were teaching us to control those uh, insect pests and diseases that were killing the vegetable crops, I could make enough money to build this house for my family. And so, although I love my real job of working with vegetable growers in the state of Ohio, I don't think I have that kind of impact that this project had and continues to have, so that's why it's my favorite picture. What, what I loved about that is that while she's talking about plants, she's really talking about the effect of her work on a human being, and that's, I mean, that's a story that we all resonate with. I brought this up yesterday to, to groans in the room, but it's exactly what Ronald Reagan did, if you'll remember that. Uh, but during the State of the Union address, he would bring people into the audience and introduce them. This is Sally from Ohio. This is what happened to her as a result of this program. This is Joanne from Wyoming, and she did thus and so. And because the public had a human connection with those people, suddenly those issues had resonance and that it's so important when you're talking about your work that you put a face to it. That's, that's key it, and your own personal connection. And I just want to conclude with one um, video of, um, this is also, also part of a before and after, you're just going to see the after video of one of the grad students that I taught last semester. You'll see she's obviously a very shy girl from India who is very intimidated about public speaking. But what is cool about it was that throughout the course of a uh, few sessions of improv, she realized that, that her story about neuroscience had an emotional um, undertone that, that would resonate with the public. So this is her, um, her final speech. and I'm a graduate student in the neuroscience program. Um, and I can still remember the first time I really got interested in neuroscience. I started off as a medical student in India, and it was towards the end of this course where we had to dissect the entire human body, and they had reserved the brain for the end. And I can still remember holding the brain in my hands. And I was looking at it, and I was like, this is where we keep ourselves. This is where everything we do, everything we feel, every emotion, everything comes from this tiny little organ, which is surprisingly small when you look at it. It's not as big as you imagine it to be. And ultimately, what is the brain? It's just a collection of cells, neurons and glia. And they're just constantly talking to each other, they're communicating to each other, they're sending out these processes that mix and intertwine and form these really complicated webs that just control everything we do. And that got me thinking, how do these webs and networks form? Before we're born, when the first brain cells develop, how do they know who to contact, which brain cell they need to talk to, which process they need to grow. How do they really know that? And that's what I really want to find out. Do they, is it something that's programmed in each nerve cell that it knows where to go? Or is it something in the environment that's telling it where to go? And that's the kind of research I'm really interested in doing. Because I have grown these neurons in like a dish of media. And even there in that artificial environment, 
they still put out these processes. They still make connections. They reach out to each other. And to me, that's the essence of human behavior. Like We reach out to each other. We make connections. And that's what helps us function as society, like this huge living organism that we call society. So I really want to know how it develops. Thanks. Wonderful story, isn't it? The only, the only people that can tell those stories are the people who live them. And so that's what we are depending on you for, to tell us your stories and make those connections with us. Do we have, we have a couple minutes. We're, no, we don't have any time at all. But does anybody have any questions? We have. I'm just asking uh, for resources for the future. Uh, I mean, it, it's great today. We're kind of uh, energized to do it. <laughs> and, but I'd like to have a resource to know tomorrow uh, how to do it. Yeah, that's great. Um, <laughs> this is a wonderful question. You know, the part of the mission of the center is to to gain affiliates so that we have training, you know, in, in areas around the country. It's, it's important, just first of all, to build awareness and enthusiasm, I think, but what we find repeatedly is, now what? You know, we did this two hours together, we did this three hours together, now what? Um, maybe, maybe you can help us answer that question. Um, we, you know, we're putting together workshops and, and conferences and those kind of ideas, but maybe there are some online opportunities or, or some ideas that you might have of, this is what I really need based on what I just did. Um, Every, I don't know if I'm on, actually. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, Every institution organization so far that is collabor collaborating with us is doing it in different ways. Um, the beauty of us just beginning is that we're flexible at this point and willing to hear. Uh, and uh, Cincinnati, for instance, uh, got a grant from the institution and is now teaching the first course in communicating science to their scientists and journalism students. Uh, and they're going to become affiliate of the Center for Communicating Science. The National Institutes of Health that I've spoken at um, at the NCI, National Cancer Institute, the National Institutes of Environmental Health Sciences, uh, will be bringing us in to train their thousand fellows, NCI fellows. Uh, so they're making it part of their training. So we're, it's, it's, you know, different needs for different types of organizations. And, um, we're willing to hear what you guys need. Looks like people are moving on to other opportunities here, so we perhaps should wrap this up. Thanks a lot. We really enjoyed Thank being you. here. Thank you very much. Thank you for your work. Thanks, Yvonne and um, Valerie, so much for doing this. And, and thank you for taking a chance on coming to something that's a little bit outside of the box for us. I hope that you uh, gained some information today. This is the beginning of a conversation. We're going to be working with Valerie and Yvonne about possibilities for APS interacting with the communication, uh, Science Center for Communication Science. Thank you all. Thanks for our volunteers at the workshops for coming up here. Have a great rest of the meeting. <laughs>